thank you for the nice introduction. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to hear a little something about the topic, Forbidden Archaeology, Evidence for Extreme Human Antiquity. <clears throat> so just uh, to keep things honest, I'm a researcher in human origins for the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And my research is inspired by my studies in the ancient Sanskrit writings in India especially the Puranas, the historical writings. Now, for many today, those two things would be complete disqualifications for me to say anything about a scientific topic in scientific circles. <clears throat> However, quite surprisingly to me even, there are people within the scientific world who are interested in hearing what I have to say and I've been invited to present my ideas at some of the leading scientific institutions in the world, such as the Royal Institution in London, the Russian Academy of Science in Moscow, Department of Anthropology, uh, the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, and many others around the world. <clears throat> so the question I'm dealing with is how old is the human species? Today, the most common answer to that question comes from the modern followers of Charles Darwin, who proposed that the first humans like us came into existence less than 200,000 years ago. Before that, they would say there were no humans like us present on this planet, simply more primitive ape-like human ancestors. <clears throat> However, the Puranas, the historical writings of ancient India, give a different idea, namely that humans have been present for vast periods of time on this planet, going back many millions of years. Now, of course, in scientific circles, I wouldn't expect anyone to take a statement from some ancient writings as evidence. So, in uh, the scientific circles where I'm invited to speak, <clears throat> I do something else. I make a prediction, namely, if what the Puranas say about human antiquity is true, there should be reports of archaeological evidence for humans existing much further back in time than 200,000 years ago, perhaps going back many millions of years. So my method for testing that prediction is to examine all archaeological reports from the time of Darwin to the present. And not just in English, I have a reading knowledge of most of the major European languages. So when I speak about examining reports from the scientific literature, I mean uh, two kinds of scientific literature, the primary and the secondary scientific literature. By primary scientific literature, I mean original reports by archaeologists, geologists, paleontologists, and other earth scientists reported in the professional peer-reviewed scientific literature. <clears throat> by secondary literature, I mean things that are based on the primary literature, such as textbooks, for example. <clears throat> so uh, I had two principal findings. <clears throat> the first finding is not so surprising. There are no reports of evidence for extreme human antiquity in the current secondary literature, textbooks, survey studies, and things of that sort. My the second finding was a little more interesting. There are many reports of evidence for extreme human antiquity in the primary scientific literature, past and present. <clears throat> so I collected those reports in this book, Forbidden Archaeology, which was reviewed in most of the professional academic and scientific journals that deal with the question of human origins. So this constitutes a kind of peer review. <clears throat> now, as you might expect, 
many of those reviews were negative, some extremely so. <clears throat> However, quite surprisingly to me even, <clears throat> even some of my critics were able to point out some positive aspects of the work. I was also hoping to get your point of view from Vedic or Purana uh, on the, on the how, how old is uh, humanity and what did you find there? Because I think uh, in the talk, somebody replied that you would also come to know about uh, religious books like Ramayana or Mahabharata, how, how much of that is true based on the archaeology, I believe. Well, you know, it depends upon what kind of circles I'm speaking in. For example, if I go to Hrishikesh or Hardwar in the Himalayan mountains and sit around with a bunch of Vedic scholars who accept statements from Vedic literature as evidence, then well, I can say, you know, in the Bhagavat Purana, there are statements that humans were existing during the Swayambhuva Manvantar period, which is in the first part of the Kalpa or the day, of, and they'll understand what I'm saying, and they'll accept that as evidence. If I'm at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress or speaking at Google headquarters, <clears throat> my audience is not necessarily going to accept a statement from the Bhagavat Purana or the Mahabharata as evidence. <clears throat> so it, it's like if you go to a baseball game, you have to play by the baseball game rules. <clears throat> and one of the rules is that you can't use a statement from a spiritual text as evidence. Could you say more about the actual contradiction between um, the extreme antiquity of humans and evolution, because in my mind, it would just seem, well, the evolution theory could just be, oh, you just have to push it back a, a few million years, and it should, could still hold up. It's just that it happened a lot earlier than people thought. That seems like a simplistic resolution. But is there something else as constraining the timeline which makes it really inconsistent? And Well, it's a good question. I'll refer you back to the statement of William Howells, who said, if the kind of evidence that I'm talking about is consistent, it's inconsistent with the general theory of evolution, because he said, the, I didn't quote everything he's, he wrote to me in his letter. He said, but you're putting evidence for an anatomically modern human presence before the known presence of even the most simple apes and monkeys, which would be our prospective ancestors. So you could conceivably come up with another version of the evolutionary theory, but it would be quite different from anything that's being proposed today. <clears throat> so that, that would be one possible response to do something like that. And if you feel inspired to do it, then right on. I think, yeah, with that, we'll end the session. And we'll thank Michael Kimo for visiting Google once again and giving us this wonderful talk.